I want to talk about veganism. And I want to talk about four kinds of veganism that I see. I call these four kinds identity veganism, boycott veganism, engaged veganism, and aspirational veganism. So you saw that my talk was called How Not to Be Vegan. So now I'm going to get to the nitty gritty of what I'm trying to argue. Not only am I trying to argue for veganism, I'm trying to argue for a particular kind of veganism. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to argue that, uh, well, let me just argue it. The view that the only ethical way to live is to adopt a vegan lifestyle I want to call lifestyle or identity veganism. Identity vegans believe that if followed strictly and universally, Veganism confers upon the practicer morally clean hands. Unfortunately, identity vegans, vegans are often perceived, rightly or wrongly, as having an air of moral superiority, as being self-righteous. The vegan police who preach veganism as the only way to fight systemic violence, who judge non-vegans and judge them as being in some way inauthentic or in some way shirking their responsibility to the cause. Now, these are the kinds of vegans that are parodied or in, in, in discussions about veganism. And you might, know, you might know some vegans like this. They're self-righteous and they think they're better. And, and they kind of think this. They think the view is kind of like this. I'm doing my part and I'm kind of pure now because I, I have no animal products. And now I've done what I need to do. And, and um, the factory farming, and all, I'm doing my part, right? One problem with identity veganism is that identity veganism is at best naive, naive and Pollyannish, and at worst a way to insulate oneself from a terribly inconvenient truth. For in reality, in late capitalist consumer culture, even vegans cannot escape the cycle of state-supported systemic industrialized violence and destruction of animals and their habitats. Vegan or not, we all have blood on our hands. Try as they will to believe otherwise, identity vegans need to face the fact that regarding our contributions to the objectification of animals and the consumption of animal products and the violence against animals, there's no moral sainthood. Vegans have blood on their hands too. So when you meet self-righteous vegans, they're just confused. That they don't understand that they're contributing to animal suffering as well. And I'll, and I'll talk about how. And the next kind of vegan I want to mention is a, a boycott vegan. A second type of veganism. The guiding principle behind boycott veganism is a rejection of the purchase and consumption of all animal products. So the boycott vegan is, is and, and these, these sort of overlap a lot, but the boycott vegan is focused on purchasing. Purchasing. So they go and they they go online and they look and they say like, oh, can I buy that product? Is there any dairy, any animal? No, I can't. That product, that, oh, I go to the store. Is this product, is this a cotton shirt? What, there's fur? Oh, I can't buy. There's fur on the cotton. I, right? So it's about consumer purchasing. And it's a kind of veganism that focuses on that. Though boycott vegans are well-intentioned, the problem with boycott veganism is that boycott veganism conflates conspicuous consumption with ethical action and political change. Simply replacing animal with plant-based products only transfers capital to global corporations through different mechanisms. Boycott veganism serves to reinforce capitalist institutions and neoliberal social structures that promote the commodification of life and disguise market forces as neutral, amoral means of distributing social goods. To limit vegan activism, to an economic boycott undercuts the moral force of veganism. And like identity veganism, it reduces it to a lifestyle choice. Further, by promoting moral progress by voting with your dollars leaves ethical responses to the exploitation of human and non-human animals to the will of the market, treating the moral status of animals as a commodity that can be purchased, traded, or given as charity. So my issue with boycott veganism is there's this systemic institutional structure that produces the suffering of animals and instead of having the 
the goal of overturning the structure, the neoliberal capitalist commodification structure, it simply says, well, just stop buying things and the market will fix everything. The market will fix the animal suffering. And I don't think that's the, the right way to, to go. The right way to go, I think, moves into engaged veganism. A third type of veganism is what uh, Jenkins and Stinescu call engaged veganism. Engaged veganism represents not simply abstention from non-human animal food sources, but refuses complicity with and symbolically disrupts the instrument, instrumentalization and hierarchy of animal life. Engaged veganism rejects anthropocentric privilege, speciesism, and human exceptionalism. Although I am in concert with the principles and the goals of engaged veganism, I believe it is obligatory for those opposed to systemic violence, oppression, exploitation, domination, and objectification to advocate for these goals in both word and deed. It is important, though, to acknowledge the realities of capitalist consumer culture. Now this leads me to aspirational veganism. And good, OK. Um, let me just say, this will be my, my, my final point here. OK. While advocating the principles of engaged veganism, I see veganism as an endless work in progress, a, prog a process of doing the best we can to minimize damage wherever and whenever we can. On this view, veganism cannot be a lifestyle. Veganism can be only an aspiration. But why can veganism be only an aspiration? The belief that a rejection of industrialized livestock products allows one to avoid complicity in harming other animals is too simplistic and ignores the complex dynamics involved in the production of consumer goods of all kinds. These expansive entanglements that people enter via the purchasing and consumption of foods of all sorts. Vegan diets have what Joel McClellan calls welfare footprints in the form of widespread indirect harms to animals, harms often overlooked or obscured by advocates of identity or boycott veganism. Industrial, industrialized agriculture harms and kills a large number of sentient field animals in the productions of fruits, vegetables, and grains produced for humans, not livestock. Large farm equipment used in the industrial production of staple crops such as wheat, corn, soybeans, vegans' favorite, harms many sentient field animals, including mice, voles, rabbits, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Participating in consumer culture involves, even for vegans, participating unwittingly in the deaths of individual, sentient, morally considerable be beings. My point is, Vegan or not, you cannot live in the United States in cap capitalist culture and not contribute to the suffering and death of animals. I don't care how vegan you are. There's no purity. There are no clean hands. We are all complicit in the suffering of animals, even vegans. For example, animal products are found in or used in the production of a great number of consumer goods, including auto upholstery, beer, candles, chewing gum, cosmetics, cranberry juice, deodorants, fertilizers, jello, hairspray, house paint, lipstick, this is an alphabetical list if you haven't noticed, marshmallows, nail polish, plywood, perfume, photographic film, pillows, lollipops, rubber, sauerkraut, shaving brushes, shaving cream, soap, soy cheese, sugar, surgical sutures, tennis rackets, transmission fluid, vitamin supplements, and wine, to name just a few. We can rail against the massive violence that is done to the huge number of living beings who did nothing to deserve their tragic fates. But neither our political commitments nor our moral outrage place of us above the violence. All aspects of consumption in late capitalism involve harming others, human and non-human. While vegans attend to the tragedy that farmed animals experience, they generally pay less attention to the harms other animals suffer in the production of numerous uh, consumer goods. Living necessitates dying and controversially killing. We can't live without killing others or at best letting them die. When we live with companion animals, for example, 
other animals will have to die. Most obviously to feed our companion animals. Even if our companion animals are vegan, dogs and cats will kill and eat other animals when they get a chance. And then we deny them, uh, when we deny them that opportunity, it becomes more obvious how problematic our power over them really is. Even if some vegans practice so-called veganic farming, which involves carefully growing plants in such a way as to not to disharm or displace animals who live on the land while growing enough food to share with the Denzians that they, uh, they may raid the fields, the vast majority of us cannot afford to create food in this way. So even veganic farming is an elitist way to produce food. Further, though some people may be in solidarity with engaged veganism, they may lack the means financial or otherwise, to practice veganism. Unlike other forms of, of, forms of veganism, aspirational veganism accommodates these kinds of situations in which fellow travelers who may be unable to actualize and in, instantiate vegan principles in their current lives can find a place in the vegan movement. Given all of this, veganism can be but an aspiration. And imagining oneself vegan in any other way is an illusion. The gist of what I want to say about this is, is that um, we all have blood on our hands and I'm advocating a certain kind of veganism. The, the thing I like about aspirational veganism is that it's an awake and aware kind of veganism. You can't be a self-righteous vegan if you're an aspirational vegan because you understand and realize that in your living your life as a vegan you are still contributing to the suffering of sentient beings. Here's something else to think about. Um, and I have this discussion with a lot of my vegan friends. So imagine that I'm a vegan and I say, I don't eat any animal products. I'm totally pure. And I only eat veganically farmed things that I produce myself. And I need to go buy a t-shirt. And I go over to Walmart and I buy a cotton t-shirt. And I walk out and I go, this is vegan. Well, if veganism is a concern over the suffering and death of sentient beings, there are sentient beings who produce that cotton, say in Bangladesh, say an 11 year old girl who gets 17 cents an hour who works 20 hours a day. That's an odd kind of veganism to me. It strikes me as odd to feel morally superior to walk out of Walmart because you didn't buy fur or you didn't buy leather. right? So aspirational veganism has as its, its goal the reduction of harm and suffering of all sentient be beings, human and non-human. Now, I know when I'm, I'm working through this, I'm thinking, well, now I'm, I'm, I'm sort of doing a semantic revision. I'm revising the, the term vegan. And I think, yeah, that's part of my project. Part of my project is to say, here's what I want veganism to mean. I want ve veganism to mean that if you're a vegan, you are a fellow traveler on the path to reducing harm for all sentient beings on the planet, human and not human. So, in closing, let me just say this. Um, I don't think that this, we need to be defeatist. I don't think we need to say, ah, screw it, everything I do causes suffering, therefore it doesn't matter what I eat. I don't believe that. I do think that as you increase your intake of animal products, you're putting a market demand and that increases. So I think there's a causal story. I also want, don't believe that you can be an aspirational vegan just by going, yeah, yeah, I, as I aspire to be vegan. Like, I, I'm ordering a hamburger. Someday I want to be a vegan. So <laughs> aspirational veganism requires an earnest and sincere commitment in both word and deed. Right? But it doesn't require you to be a moral saint. And so the reason why I, I am um, advocating for aspirational veganism is that I hope that people will see that it's, it's, a, it's an invitation. It's a turning towards. It's not as many vegan practices and vegans themselves presented as it's a special club and you're not vegan and you're bad. I want to see veganism as an invitation. I want us all to aspire to be vegan in word and deed. And I want to invite you to think about these issues, think about your daily practices, and think about things like how can I reduce harm and violence and domination and oppression? How can I be that kind of person? And I think vegan, aspirational veganism,
plays a part in that. Thank you.